Keep pressure. That's one. Are my judges ready? Every day we are spending more for energy than we should due to poor insulation, inefficient lighting, appliances, and heating and cooling equipment. Good evening. My name is Victor Roshko, and I would like to talk to you about my research and project my senior year. Imagine yourself sitting at home, drinking, drinking a cup of coffee during the winter, and the heater is cranked up all the way, and you hear the whistling of the wind and the cracks of the walls. See, if your house would be retrofitted, you would not have that problem. I did my research over retrofitting. Retrofitting is a more modernized home that is energy efficient and or earthquake resistant. In, in this picture, we see how this house is not retrofitted. These arrows here are the cold air coming in from the windows and the doors and the house, from the outside. The cold air is coming inside. And it's also losing heat by the, the warm air is coming into the attic because the attic isn't well insulated. The reason I chose this, the retrofitting or my research is because it was an unfamiliar topic to me and I never knew anything about it before I did my research. And after researching more about it, I decided that I want my future home to be retrofitted. There are two types of, there are two main types of retrofitting. There's energy efficient and seismic. In this picture, we see how the structural steel cage stabilizes the building against lateral movement in an event of an earthquake. So if an earthquake were to occur, this building is able to bend with the lateral movements of the earthquake. Here are some of the types of insulation you'd want to use for your attic insulation. Loose fill fiberglass, spray foam, cardboard, cloth, <clears throat> recycled paper, and chunks of wood. You could also combine all them together 
for a more greater effect. You can either build your home retrofitted or you can remodel it. It would definitely be easier to build your home retrofitted than to remodel it because it would be it wouldn't be as expensive. Some of the things you'd want to consider when retrofitting your home are solar panels for more modernized and energy efficiency, as well as LED lighting, sealing any holes and cracks, and simply replacing old material. For my product, I built a customized portable chicken coop with many cool features in it. Like for example, this is uh, the removable manure drawer. You could pull it out and dump the manure out. Uh, skids for portable use. You could hook your four-wheeler up to it and drag it so the chickens would have more grass to eat. As well as chicken nests and roosts for them to sleep on. So you sleep at. The material I used was chicken wire, treated lumber, aluminum roof, screws and nails. I had to consider the fact that we have predators that like chickens and I had to pick the right size of the of the fence so that those predators can get in and eat the chickens. Also I used tre treated lumber uh, instead of regular lumber because tr treated lumber is soaked in oils that are meant for outside conditions. The reason I chose this product is because since the age of 10, I've been working with wood, and it's a familiar topic to me. I even remember the, all the birdhouses I built with my dad, and at, at this point, I even helped my dad build cabinets and many other carpentry work. It is also my preferred vocation, something I'd want to do in my future, because it interests me. Some of the things I learned while cons constructing my chicken coop was simple roofing and also planning ahead. I had to write down a written plan before building my chicken coop so I would know what I need and the exact dimensions. The challenges I faced while building it were I was often working alone and it was hard for me because this was my first chicken coop I ever built, so I didn't really have anybody I could ask advice from. Also, the lack of experience in roofing. I'm not really good at roofing, and I'm not a roofer, and not really planning to be one. And I also built my trusses crooked, so that also kind of messed up the, the way the aluminum metal looked, so I had to trim it. The connection between my project and my essay my research is building for the comfort and convenience. Just like a retrofitted home is built for the comfort and convenience of the owner, this chicken coop has been built for the comfort of the chickens and the convenience of the owner. Also, a retrofitted home is supposed to be modernized. Just like this chicken coop has been built with modern equipment and style. Thank you for your time. Do you have any questions? Did you build this at home or at school? No, I built this in shop class. Yeah, I'm in so, so you chose to redesign your, your roof based on the crooked trusses rather I, than straighten out the trusses? Well, I didn't really redesign the roof. I just but trimmed. Trim. Yes, trimmed the So you didn't, you didn't straighten out the crooked trusses? Yes, I did. Why, why did you make that choice? Because the I already screwed like most of the metal on, and then I realized that the problem. At first, I thought it was the metal or something. It, like I said, I, I never really done any roofing, so that was a pretty challenging task for me. So how difficult would it be to retrofit a uh, say a twenty-year-old house? Well, it matters if you're if you're building your house and you want to retrofit it. Like I said, it'd be a lot much more easier and less expensive. And would you want to know like 
some of the things you want to retrofit? Well, or? just, yeah, I guess, but what are some of the things you would retrofit? Like I said, like, like it, I showed in the picture of the house where the air, the cold air was coming in, you'd want to seal, like, ar around the doors and or outside the windows. The attic also, attic insulation is really important too, because that's, like, all the air just goes up there, the warm air. Um, in any of your research, I know my son's been looking into building houses using straw bales, hay bales. In any of your research, did, did you find that that was a good insulation? Like hay? Uh -huh. Actually, in fact, like you're saying this right now, and I, on my research paper, I, I'm pretty sure I have hay in, in it, but I didn't put it on the slide. Because oh, okay. there's actually many types of different insulations you can use. So is that that would be a good one then? Too? Yes. Chicken coop floor is that wire? Like the maybe where you pull out the manure drawer? Oh no, it's not wire. It's just mm -hmm. it's it's a just a plywood. Okay, so that's the floor. Though. Yeah. Okay. I, see. I thought maybe you had a floor of wire and it fell through, and then actually when you pull the drawer out. Um, Who was your mentor? Uh, Leo Fokina. Okay, but but he didn't he didn't help you with the roof. Not with the roof. No.
Are my judges ready? Yes. The breed that was considered the nanny dog in the 1800s is now considered violent and aggressive, all due to a stereotype they have received. The pitbull, the pitbull should not be banned, all due to a stereotype, the attacks related to the breed, and all the danger of handling one incorrectly. Good evening, my name is Josie Lunt, and I'm going to be talking to you about the pitbull ban. In the words of Brown and Diggy, if we want to own a dog with their teeth come along, it is up for it's up to us to learn how and when dogs use them and to keep our dogs out of situations where they feel like they need to. In the early 1700s, the ancestor of the pit bull, mainly the bulldog, was brought from England to the United States. The bulldog was a, such a strong breed, it was used by hunters to trap large game. The bulldog's strength also came at a disadvantage for it. As in the early 1800s, dog fighting started with the bulldog. They, would, they were used in uh, fights such as baiting matches, which, which is when you use a bigger dog against a smaller dog for entertainment. People began to enjoy the sport of dog fighting and wanting to build a bigger, better dog, thus creating the bull, pit bull by bringing their bulldogs to tan terriers. In the early 1900s, pit bulls were so loved by America, they received the name Yankee Terrier. A pit bull, a war dog named Sergeant Stubby, was used in World War I, and he received more medals than any other war dog throughout history. Sergeant Stubby saved the lives of many French troops by alerting them of incoming gas attacks minutes before the attacks actually even happened. He was also used to drag wounded soldiers off the battlefield into safety. In the 1920s is where the pit bull's popularity really, really just went up. They were known as America's dog, and they appeared on the cover of Life magazines three times due to their popularity. No other dog breed has appeared on Life magazine more than once, besides the pit bull. They also took over the movie screen with a pit bull named Pal the Wonder Dog. Pal the Wonder Dog appeared in, in over 224 movies, while a German shepherd named Ren Tin Tin only appeared in 137. Many companies across America also called for pit bulls to be used in their advertisements, not because they believe pit bulls to be dangerous, but because they believe pit bulls to be so appealing to people across America, regardless of race, social class, and age. 
Many cultural icons have shared their lives with pit bulls, such as Sir Walter Scott, Helen Keller, Dr. Seuss, Theodore Roosevelt, and Woodrow Wilson. In the 1970s is where everything went wrong for this breed. Dog, headlines of dog fighting in America exploded. The, mark, the cycle of desperation, violence, fear caused the market for aggressive dogs. In dog fighting, the best dog can be worth over $100,000, meaning this sport isn't likely to end anytime soon. After dog fighting happened, reports of dog attacks on humans began to appear and multiply. The pit bull became the victim of became the victim of a media ran by fear. Misinformed people and reporters believed that ending this breed would also end any attacks, but that's not true. This started the ban. There are many places with the ban throughout uh, Canada and the United States. In Canada, many provinces in Canada, such as Toronto, claim that the pit bull should not be owned there after the ban, but the mayor has claimed if a pit bull has been owned before the ban took place, then the pit bull can stay, but he must be muzzled at all times, he must be neutered and kept on a chain, and can never go out without a leash. In the United States, more than 937 cities have a strong pit bull ban. Many people are against the ban, however, saying if a pit bull should be banned just because of that their capability to bite, then any other large dog should be, because any dog is able to bite. Um, owners should be more responsible and take actions for their dog, for their dog's uh, actions. And other people claim that instead of banning a breed completely, there can be other methods that can be used, such as microchipping, where you know where your dog is at any time in case he gets out. Safe enclosures, keeping a dog in a safe, sturdy enclosure so it cannot escape and possibly harm somebody. And the most important to me is a background, a background check of abuse. If a person has a history of dog abuse, then they should not be able to own a dog because of the possibility of them abusing this dog, causing it to be aggressive and hurt people. The Pipple isn't the only breed that has considered has a bad reputation over the past few years. These two breeds you are very common today, but you wouldn't really think that they've had a bad reputation in the past. In the late 1800s, all attacks from 1864 to 1899 were all from the bloodhound. The bloodhound was feared because they were used to chase slaves from plantations. And then after World War I, attacks from German shepherds appeared and multiplied. The German shepherd became very feared for their association with Nazis. Pit bulls actually have really good personalities despite all the rumors and stereotypes. According to this chart from the Huffington Post, pit bulls are about the nicest dog breed there is. They scored a 86.8 on a temperament test, right below the Labrador Retriever and above the Golden Retriever. Pit bulls are very energetic. They make a great family dog for a young family with children. They love to go on adventures and are always up for any adventure offered. Pit bulls are also very brave. Three pit bulls were used after the terrorist type attack of 9-11 to help search and rescue for people under the debris. And last year in Florida, a resident of Florida, Melissa Butt, claimed that her two pit bulls are the reason her, her grandson is alive. She claims that her grandson was playing in the garden one evening when her two pit bulls started barking and ran over there and took multiple strikes to the face from a copperhead. She claims that if the pit bulls weren't there that day, she probably would have lost her grandson. There are many reasons for dog attacks. Sometimes a dog can just snap out of nowhere, but most of the time that is not the reason. Over 84% of dog, fatal dog attacks are from dogs that have been neglected and abused throughout their life. If a dog is trained to be aggressive and has a history of, history of that, then they're going to be aggressive. Some people use pit bulls to guard drug companies and they become aggressive to, to keep people out. Um, if a, if a dog has a history of abuse, it's going to lash out out of fear of human contact. For my product, I volunteered at the West Plains Regional Animal Shelter. I cleaned pens, I walked dogs, and I got to help them out any way I could. And I wanted to still help them out, so I took two of their dogs down to Tractor Supply Grand Opening for a adoption day. I also made a flyer and had the cashiers of Tractor Supply hand them out to every person after they got their stuff. I talked about how the animal shelter is a non-profit organization and that they cannot continue to help these animals without the help of us. They are in need of volunteer work. They, all the supplies they need, they 
because they do so much for the for these animals, but without our help and our donations, they couldn't do that. And then the stray animals would not have a safe would not have a safe house over their head and food in their stomachs. The reason I chose to do this project is because when I was younger, I spent a lot of time at my grandpa's small farm, and I learned to have a heart for animals and nature. And I also own a pit bull. I've owned him for a few years now, and he's kind of changed our family views. My parents used to believe that pit bulls were a dangerous dog until we got one in our lives, and we've learned that they're not. They're not dangerous. They're actually very sweet and kind, and they're very misunderstood. Um, I faced a lot of challenges during my product. It was hard for me to find an event because I called many events around here, such as Pioneer Day, OzFest, and all of them actually had a dog ban because of the fear of having a dog attack. Finding the time to do this was really hard too because my mentor, Don Northrup, that works at the West Plains Animal Shelter, was always busy with meetings and having to stay at the shelter, being the only one there that day. And my anxiety was hard for me. I don't like going out in public doing things like this. It was really difficult, but knowing that I wanted to help these dogs, I went through it and I overcame it. Um, it was really important to me because I know that both these dogs now have a home and it was because of my product and, my, and the shelter received donations. I brought, when I was done, I brought them six bags of cat food to thank them for all their help and letting me use their dogs for my product. In conclusion, the pit bull was once an icon of America, and now they're at the risk of being banned all due to a stereotype and false rumors going around about this breed. The pit bull ban can be stopped, however, it will take time and understanding. The first step would be to end dog fighting completely and to create stronger laws against people who have a history of dog fighting. The last step would be to learn the history of this breed and understand the false information from the true. And hopefully one day the pit bull can return to can, can return to be America's icon once again. Thank you. Any questions? So were the two dogs that you adopted out were they pit bulls? They were not pit bulls. Um, my mentor didn't want to give me any large dogs because he was scared that I couldn't handle it myself. So they were not. Have you checked on the two dogs to see how the owners are doing? I haven't. I asked him about it and he said that they are in good homes and that they're loved. That's all I know so far. Did they have pit bulls in the shelter? Yeah, they do. They, uh, he claims that uh, the pit bull breed, like mixes and bull bloods, are the most common dog breed that comes through the shelter and they're, they actually get adopted more than any other breed either. So. Did you find the owners there at the Tractor Days event, or did it occur later? Um, he said that it occurred a few days after my product. They right. came in with the flyers and they sent them up. Do you know what caused the pet bull ban? Um, what was the main reason? I think the main reason was the attacks related to the breed, and people began to assume that this breed was just aggressive. But that's do they have a bike history? They do have a, a bike history. They claim that the pit bull actually attacks more than any other dog breed, which that isn't true. I found a chart from Toronto claiming that the pit bull is actually the fifth dog that has the highest, and the highest breed is actually the German Shepherd. But the American pit bull is the lowest for dog bite, uh, dog attacks. Pit bull just named dog. Yeah, they were known as nanny dogs and nursing maids. They were used to watch children in the early 1800s to 1900s. Any other questions?
Are my judges ready? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Every year, more than 400 kids die from unintentional firearm injuries. What if we, as adults, could help prevent this by simply teaching gun safety? Good evening. My name is Logan Wood, and I'm here to talk to you about my product, Gun Safety and Trap Shooting Clinic. Many people ask, what is trap shooting? Trap shooting is defined as the sport of shooting a clay pigeon from a spring-loaded thrower. Many kids do not realize the amount of effort and work it takes to put into this. They think they can just show up and do their best, but it also takes a lot of work put into it to get good. <clears throat> For my research paper, I chose to talk about a few important subjects to me, and I wanted to know why kids need gun safety. Many people don't think kids need gun safety but just like the kid in the cookie jar that takes a cookie after dinner, kids are curious and they want to explore. When they see mom and dad going in there and handling the guns, they do not realize that they too need to be safe. When parents practice gun safety around their kids, kids are most likely to pick it up and follow them. Just seeing their parents do it is the best thing. I also want to talk about kids handling guns. Many kids do not realize, but the way they handle a gun can affect everything. When you pick up a gun and you point it at somebody, that is probably the worst thing you can do. But when you hold the gun in a safe position in the air or point it at the ground, that is like the best thing. And I also want to talk about school shootings. What many people do not realize is school shootings are not always the ones that happen from somebody who knows everything about guns. Most kids that are involved in a school shooting are the ones who know nothing about guns and are 
illiterate. We can see headlines popping up all over the news of school shootings and armed robberies that are happening with toy guns. What people do not realize is kids need gun safety, and one way to do this is to teach them the difference between a toy and a real gun. Up here on the board, I have a real gun, but to a kid who plays with a toy every day that looks just like this, they may not know the difference between a toy and a real gun. I feel that if we encourage our kids to know the difference and teach them more about gun safety, then it will be less problems. I also wanted to work on the aspect of childhood exposure. When guns are in homes, I believe it's perfectly fine, but you must have them stored and locked away per the right way. When guns are out in the open and loaded, you're most likely to have a bad chance of somebody doing a bad thing. Kids, again, are curious, just like the kid in the cookie jar. They want to explore, they want to see what can happen. So when guns are stored away in a gun safe, or even a gun cabinet that has a lock, they're less likely to go in and be curious. I wanted to also talk about, in front of these people, the parents when they practice gun safety. I believe that it's the best thing for these kids. They're gonna learn more from their parents, even what they learned from me. For my product, I did several things, but behind the scenes, I wanted to have a clean place for these kids to come. I did want, not want their first impression to be wow, this is a nasty place, I never want to come back. I spent a lot of time and hours at the range mowing the grass, picking up the trash, and just making it a presentable place. I also wanted it to be a safe place. I felt like this year, this last fall, when I was shooting trap, it became a place that I not always wanted to go to. Uh, we had a lot of new kids show up and they began to not know anything. Many of the kids that came were coming because they thought it was fun, and they didn't realize the amount of effort and the hard work it takes for them to learn. The, the guns were pointed in wrong possessions, and a lot of times it just was not a fun place to be. And I wanted my five kids that showed up to know the gun range operations. I felt that it was very important for these kids to know what was gonna happen and how it was happening. They needed to know that they had to show up on time and they had to be there throughout the whole thing. They couldn't just leave when they were done, and they needed to be there to help clean up. For the first half of my product, I took the kids, after they had watched the high schoolers shoot for about an hour, behind the cars, and I was able to talk to them about gun safety. We worked on many things. We worked on how to hold a gun in the right position, what you can do if bad things happen at the gun range, what happens when somebody is loading the thrower, or just simply what you do with your eyes when you're shooting. Many of these kids did not know that when you shoot trap, you keep both eyes open. And for the second part of my product, I wanted to actually let these kids shoot. So I took them down to the main area that we actually shoot, and I put them on the line. One by one, we worked through the first couple rounds, and they each got to shoot and get a little help and just work through it. And then by the end, they had shot 50 rounds and were shooting better than the high schoolers did that day. I have a little video. <clears throat> this was the second time that they had gone up to shoot. Many of these kids had never shot before. This was their first time. They knew nothing. They showed up, one had turkey loads, and he did not realize that you don't shoot a trap with turkey loads. <laughs> so I was able to help these kids just learn what you need, what to have, and how to shoot. When they got up to this area right here, a lot of them didn't realize that you stayed in the same place for five times to shoot, and then you move. I just was able to help these kids learn everything they needed to know. The reason I felt that I could help them do this was when I was in 4-H, I had an instructor who taught me everything I know about gun safety. He felt that it was very important that we go through a course before we shot, 
and just learn everything we could. I also had a gun range operator who was very adamant about teaching gun safety and he helped us through a lot of it. I felt my project benefited many people. The main <clears throat> children that I wanted to focus, focus on was the youth. I wanted these kids to learn everything they could about gun safety. I wanted them to know what was going to happen, why, why it was going to happen, and where it was going to happen. I didn't want them, when they come to high school, just to get up there and not know what was going on, and I didn't want them to feel scared. I also felt like it was benefiting the trap range. The people that own this property put a lot of time and effort into it. They have helped us become where we are, and they just spent a lot of time. And I felt like by doing this, I was not only helping me and the kids, but also the gun range owners, because they had a safer place when they came. I also think it benefited the FFA. Next year, when they go shoot, they're going to have kids coming in for the first time but these kids will come in knowing what's going on, what gun safety is, and how they can apply it. They won't be the type of kid that gets up there and knows nothing. I had a couple struggles in my product. My main one was talking. I hate talking in front of people. You put me in the front of a class of 30 A plus kids though, and I can do it and I can teach all day, but you put me in front of people my age and I just get as nervous as I can. Another was teaching. Just like talking, I can't teach or talk in front of anybody. I feared this for weeks. I studied, I wrote my notes several times, and I just practiced as hard as I could. By the time I got up there, I knew it so well that I didn't even need my paper. And I felt that I just got over this really good. Every year, more than 400 kids die from unintentional firearm injuries. What if we as adults could help teach them simple things like handling guns or gun safety to help prevent these things. Thank you. Do my judges have any questions? Yes. Can you describe as the instructor, can you describe how you felt the first time you saw one of your students uh, mishandle the weapon? Um, I felt that although they didn't follow my lead, when we got to go back and review it again, they learned even better. Just as a question, did you have parents also on the range? Yes, my parents were there and my ag teachers were there. And I think four out of the five kids' parents were there. Do you think those parents have, have also had a role in like helping those children learn? Yes, I feel like it's, like I said, it's the most important when they learn from their parents. They learn, I mean, kids learn everything from their parents. So for the ones that hadn't shot before, how did you, I mean, how did you get them not to be afraid of the weapon the first time they fired? Well, a lot of them had brought their own guns. Although they hadn't shot, their parents had. And we just sat back when the gun safety, when we were done with that, the high school was still shooting. So we stood back there and we just talked it through what was going to happen. And I actually let them hold a gun and point it at the bushes and just showed them what was going to happen, you know, and we just walked through everything. And they got to watch the dead kids, as they called it, go through it all. And when we got up there, we worked one by one down through there and just, you know, just worked one kid at a time and showed them what was going to happen. Well, you said that most shooters don't know much about guns. What was your source for that? I had found the paper, but I don't remember now. I'm sorry. Is that one of those? No. Those are what I used for my for this outline for this. Thank you. I had found that on my research paper. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
about the liability. I was, I was just wondering what he thought the parents' role was. Yeah, I'm just giving you a hard time. Okay. Gotta be careful. <laughs> Teach me how to shoot a gun. Mm -hmm. And what are you waiting on? I don't know. You've been married a hundred years. I know. I do feel like I've been married a hundred years. No, no I've just seen your husband. Yeah. He's aged a hundred years. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the kids' fault. Uh, that's the kids' fault. Amen. <laughs> I look a little older, too. Is everyone in here a judge again? Yes.
to hear Chelsea and Lindsay coordinating their schedules so that they could take dinner together. Well, isn't that sweet? That's all I've heard about all week. <laughs> <laughs> you have a boring office, is all I do. No. It's those two, they're that's excited pretty, about it. That's pretty competitive. Yeah. Chelsea wanted to know what I was having there, and I told her didn't really have a dinner break. But I did eat. Pretty good. What's your look at him? You're an Italian kind of guy. I think you're doing it. There Midget, ready? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. okay. So, okay. Some of the products that we use every day, like chairs, cabinets, and doors, they all have one thing in common. They're made out of wood. Good evening. I am Curtis Hafer, and I'm going to tell you about the benefits of wood products. So, uh, for my research paper, the topic I chose was, okay, was uh, the benefits of the products because I know that we use them a lot, so I decided to write about it. And one thing that the, one of the benefits of the products is that they help with money because the lumber industry is a multi billion dollar, multi -billion dollar industry that supplies important materials to paper mills and construction companies and sawmills and, and processing mills help with the economy in small towns and Europe has been accounted for 49 billion dollars in the lumber the wood market which is also 13.3 percent of market shares according to RBAC the Global wood market is expected to grow from three hundred and seventy three billion dollars in twenty sixteen to five hundred and thirty two billion dollars in twenty twenty. Another way, reason that they have this is they have they're good for building materials. Because the wood that they use for building is somewhat fire resistant because the from the layer of charcoals that protects the wood on the inside so that way they can continue holding the structure up. And it is naturally electrical resistant whenever it is reduced to a moisture content, a certain moisture content. And the, the wood is also more insulating because of its natural cellular structure. So it'll be more insulating than steel or concrete. The wood, another benefit of them is jobs. Because in 2016, 163,238 jobs were counted based on the wood industry in 2016. And 96,000 of the jobs are in, from sawmills. An additional 266,000 jobs are also based on routing. Could they require the sawmills to work? 
can whatever you buy wood to make, to make a market for them. So you'd have to have people getting the wood from forests, and you'd have to have people to cut the wood into the correct boards that people would use. And we can also use them for power. We need 2008 power mills that run off wood created 6,700 megawatts, which is enough energy to run 6 million homes. And then yeah, developing countries, they use this mainly, which supplies that power to 2 million people. America is turning towards the wood burning plants. And for, for my product that I did, was I created a bunk bed. I was originally going to make the bunk bed out of oak, but I it was going to be too expensive for what I was going to make at the time, so I had to change it to pine. I didn't use treated lumber, so and uh, I, cre I created the first two parts at a, not at my at a shop, so that way, because it when you can build it in the room. The way we created the front end and the back end of the beds, we brought the pieces of the wood to my to my house so that we, we could bring them we could finish building the bed so that way we could build the end pieces there and put the slats on. Because if we would have completed the bed in the shop it would have been too big to fit through the hallway. So we had to make it in parts. So some of the challenges that I had had in creating the bunk bed was some of the wood that I had was not in good condition. It had, but some of them were rounded at the ends and had bark covering them. So I had to find ways that I could use the pieces and put them in spots that wouldn't be as noticeable. So that way the bed would look nicer. So, and my, I had to find time for my mentor because he had some things to do. So I had to find some time. And at one point, whenever we were making the bed, we had put the pieces on, but then we found out that uh, we, excuse me, we had put the pieces on wrong. So we had to take it apart, and then we had to rebuild the bed. We had to rebuild the section. So, so we should we should use wood products because it helps people and the economy whenever we use them. So thank you. And are there any do you have any questions? Yes. When you uh, were constructing the bed, uh, how did you <laughs> attach the, the, the various um, pieces? We use screws okay. and some glue, but whenever some of the pieces had, whenever we glue them, some of them started to fall off, so that we had to screw some of them in. So we used uh, mainly screws, but we used some glue as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you get the lumber from a lumber yard? Was this dimension lumber, or did you pick it up from the sawmill? Uh, we got it from, we got the wood from Wagner's. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bruce, where did you get the plans? Um, we had found them. Uh, the site thing that helps that had plans for the mm -hmm. Were there a number of designs and you had to pick up one? Well, who did the site? Just had like the one bed. So there's just one oh. bit design that seemed to work. Yeah, it was not work. The one that was design oh. worked. The design it was pretty good. 
How old are your sisters? Um, 12 and 11, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they were older than that. One of them's going to be turning 13 soon, so. Yeah, 12 were, and 11. Were they pretty happy to uh, yeah. get their own beds and off the floor? <laughs> yes. Yeah, awesome. But I had to smell first. And when you said that it was uh, going to be used for years to come, is that because you built it really well and it's going to stay together for years to come, or is it just because it won't fit back out the door? I'm being uh, funny. I'm being funny. I'm sorry. I hope they don't destroy because I don't think it'll be up to. Have, have they uh, done a lot of jumping on it? No. No? They've not. And if they did, they shouldn't. I don't know about it. Have you thought about any future projects? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm so good. Sweat in my eye. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Thank you. Well, I did make a, like a little st stand thing. I made a stand. Well, on behalf of the folks from the area that are involved in the timber industry, I know that they appreciate your awareness. The uh, timber industry in Missouri is the number one agricultural product. It's a $8 billion a year industry in Missouri, so I know they appreciate you noticing that. Thank you. Are you in this one? Are you in this one? Yes. Let's see if I click on the mic. Oh, I, I type well. <laughs> I think they all appreciate that. Tell her dad she, still tell hand writes all his stuff. Yeah, I tell her she doesn't have to type your stuff. <laughs> generally, generally now, it's, while I'm working on one thing, I hit the intercom button and say, can you send this letter to so-and-so about <laughs> this? And then she'll bring me a draft of it, and I'll go, 
Yeah, that's pretty much what I meant. Start changing the budget. Why didn't you just tell me that in the first place? Yeah. We're getting there. Yeah. Learning curve. Uh -huh. Learning curve mostly for you. Yeah. Ninety percent of it is. But I'm trying to. I'm trying to work on something here and trying to dictate. They just got to get the new guy trained. Pretty much. That's all the amount. They're getting close. Yeah. I know how they think. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I have a pretty, pretty new 45 in my possession. Oh, yeah? I bought a, a brand new Kimber Raptor the other day. How you like it? I love it. Yeah, I really do. I, I wanted the nine. Um, Actually, had ordered the nine in like the uh, all the size up from the micro carry. I don't remember what Kendra calls there, the ultra carry or something. Uh, and at that time, that was when Obama was in office. Kimber, pretty well, gun shops got where the Kimber sound yeah, out there. Yeah, they would yeah. put in orders and stuff, and then Kimber would just send them where they wanted to. So they would get the gun. I got a Kimber, but it wasn't one of them. And, uh, but yeah, I uh, came across this one. Brand new in the box, and bought it for a low cost, so I couldn't hardly pass it up. I can't go wrong with it. And it is a shooting machine. Oh my gosh, it's free. <laughs> yeah, that's one thing I'll give them credit for. <laughs> it is pretty. When it comes to, uh, when it comes to cleaning it, I don't like the cameras because you got to have a little tool to. Can you not make up your mind where you want to be or what's the deal? <laughs> Only in here. Well, no, you left. Yeah, I saw. I witnessed. My tummy started ground. <laughs> That was, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I guess I'll go again. I've got three. Let's see. And for this one, I'm going to have a room change, so I have 20 minutes. Yeah. And then I have a room change after that. So I know three times. There you go. Take advantage of it. I figure since I'm trying this uh, overdose case in Christian County, I might as well go to the eviction senior project and see how that goes. See if you can pick up your point. Maybe I'll pick up some statistics. Yeah, you might find a jury. There you go. See how that there you goes. Go. I learned this from a senior oh, yeah, I don't know where, I don't know where this kid and not a senior citizen. That's what I'm doing. Come on. Hey, are you going to have a
nervous? You got this. Are my judges ready? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. I want you to think about the last time you've heard on the news a police officer that's been killed in the line of duty. Um, was it recently? Was it a long time ago? Or have you heard it one too many times? Good evening. My name is David Hawking, and I'm going to be talking to you about the inside life of a police officer. The chart here shows that last year of 2017, it hit the second time lowest at 128 officers killed in the line of duty since going all the way from 1957 all the way to 2017. There are people that put their lives in harm's way every day. It's not, it's not something they do, it's something they are. If you think about it, every day you can come here to school or go to work and you're not in worry. But that's because of these people here that are out there every day putting their putting their lives in harm's way so that you don't have to fear. My research was into the inside life of a police officer. Many people look at them as they just write tickets or put you in jail. But it's not sometimes as simple as that. First off, entering an academy or wanting to become a police officer requires training, a lot of training. First, you will go through about six months of training at a police academy wherever you go. It can't, some require, require many more. A uh, state trooper, you do have to go to college and get criminal justice. Uh, some of the training, like the picture shown on the left, is firearms training. About every three months, you'll have to go to a firing range and shoot in front of an instructor to make sure that the instructor and that you're qualified for the job in case it did come down to a situation that you're fully trained in that field. Secondly is takedown procedures, arrest procedures. The picture on the right is shown how to properly arrest someone. The demonstration there was just simply taking someone down and cuffing them. That's putting the danger, if they're a danger to you, that you're, you have control of the situation. Farther into the research, some don't think about this part, the effects of the job. One being mental health. Say an officer's in a shooting and shoots someone. You have to think, is that gonna affect that officer later in life or is it gonna affect him for the rest of his life? Every day he has to wake up and think about, I pulled the trigger on someone that has been shot. They can also develop PTSD, which is stress disorder, which can take a huge effect on them. Constantly worrying, they also lose self-confidence. Self-confidence, such as they think that everyone is watching them, that they need to be a perfect example of the community. Their family also takes a toll on this. If the, if the officer has kids that are in sports or any kind of extra activity at schools, sometimes these officers have to take time out of their family to do their job. Me and you, we can go to family gatherings on weekends. We don't, we don't have to worry about going to a job sometimes. But these people have to take time away from their own families to protect you and me so that we can go to our family gatherings. Why I chose my product? I felt like I needed to choose a product that would give back and show appreciation and locally. It shows appreciation just that, hey, there's people out here that's appreciating what you're doing every day. 
you're not just out there that's being forgotten. There's people like us, some of us, that take this more personally. I know this from a fact because my dad used to be a cop. And I understand that, you know, sometimes we can see the effects of that later on in life. My product was a handmade holster and a mag pouch. My mentor was Shannon Caldwell that works for Al County Sheriff's Department. As you can see, there, this one fits, fits specifically for a Glock 43. Each, there, you can make many t different types of holsters. But first, I'll go into some of the inside details of the holster. As you can see here, there's two stitch lines. You can make double stitches or single stitches. In this case, I, li I like the double stitches. I just think it looks more professional and it holds a lot longer than a single stitch roll. The mag pouch as well. You can see it was done single stitch, but that's just because they're on the mag pouches, it's harder to do a double stitch. The process, it was, it was pretty challenging for me. Um, there's a lot of steps, a lot more steps than I thought there would be that's required to make the holster. Um, it comes into first finding the right fit, drawn part out that you, that you have to make out of the leather. You have to cut that shape out with a, I guess you could call it an exacto knife or a box cutter even, and exactly trace it and cut it out perfectly with no edges. Next comes the steps of, um, next would be the steps of putting the holster together. You take the two pieces of leather that you've made a front and a back for that you've cut out and you, you take cement glue and spread on both sides. You must take a flat headed hammer and be, make sure that you hit it evenly. If you hit it unevenly, it can leave indentions into the leather and then it just doesn't make for a good product. After that, you draw out your stitch patterns. There's a, my mentor has done this for a few years now, so he already had all these drawn out on a thing, on a, a piece of paper that you overlay. But it still sounds comp more complicated than it actually was. Once you lay that, that piece of paper over it, you have to exactly mark each stitch on there so that while you're stitching, like the picture on the right there, that you stitch on the correct lines and then it comes out. The challenges I faced was time. My mentor working for Al County Sheriff's Department, it made it really difficult because I never knew if he was going to be overtime or if he was going to get called in on a day that he wasn't scheduled that we had planned, which happened a few times. Coordination. Um, during the project, it took a lot of coordination. The sewing part was the extremely hardest. You had to do it all by eye. It was all straight lined up by your eye. And it took me about five or six tries on leather before I finally got down the straight lines. After the straight lines, I moved into a next problem that I was not ready to face, which was going around the corners. Corners were extremely more hard than I thought. When I, it's, it's harder to look at something and eyeball it up than have something guiding you. The patience. It took a lot of patience each time I had to sit and watch my mentor very closely and carefully paying close attention to each little detail. Because if I used a detail, I could mess the whole product up and have to restart all over. And my time was limited. Like I said, helping out. I just wanted to do a project, product that showed appreciation for our local law enforcement that shows, hey, there's people out here that realize the job you do, and it's not as easy as some think, or some people look at police officers different than others, and respect. I understand that sometimes, you know, we get tickets, but you have to look at it from a different aspect. If you show them respect, they will show you respect, and it's always been like that. Thank you. Do my judges have any questions? What do you plan to do with your product? I'm going to give it to Officer Moore for our school resource officer, just showing him appreciation because my whole years, even before I got into high school, he's been our resource officer and he's he's been really good to me and he's he's pretty helpful. He's really helpful. You kind of mentioned a couple of times about not knowing whether or not you'd have time. Was there ever a time that working with Shannon, he would have to leave or get called out, or did you have any trouble? No, uh, he never did get called out. 
but there was a few times, there was a few instances that weather even came in and it affected us because I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to get to his house or if he had to work late just because of the weather because he had to drive from West Plains to get back to Willow. So it was just kind of a guessing game sometimes, but we, we communicated, communicated pretty well. Did you enjoy it? Oh yeah, I enjoyed it. I uh, I thought it was pretty fun. I learned a new skill. Mm -hmm. I think I I would be really interested in doing it again. Yeah. And uh, I mean, like I said, I could like Shannon does. He he's made a career out of it, and I think that's pretty neat. But it's it's pretty cool to take something that's as simple as cowhide and make a uh, work and make a product out of it. So I thought that was pretty neat, and it was not what I expected. Do you have your product with you? Yeah, it's in my truck, actually, oh. but yeah. Um, it, was, it, was, it was really enjoyable. I liked it a lot. Okay, so you can basically start out with two flat pieces of leather. Uh-huh. And I guess there's, you have like a template or something that, yeah it's a it's a template um or a specific way. yeah each specific gun has a certain template certain okay. stitch pattern uh okay. yeah but pretty much you you'll soak the leather in warm uh, it's warm water yeah. not hot and you'll soak the leather and you'll take it out which loosens leather and then we take a aluminum or plastic gun molding and you'll put in there like he's got a uh, He's got about every gun cast you can think of. Yeah, and it'll shape, and you leave it set overnight, which will, uh, the leather will dry and harden, and then it'll take shape of that gun, and it'll stay like that once it, yeah. Do you think uh, you do this in the future someday? Um, actually, yeah, I'd like to do it in the future one day. I'd like to, I don't know if I'd like to have my own business, but I'd like to help out. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Post high school plans? Um, so far, I plan on working, and then I'm going to go and get my criminal justice, and I'm going to shoot for state trooper. Okay. So when I'm about 19, I'll probably try to start getting that going. Okay. And pretty set on that's that's my path I want to take. So. Does your mentor, um, the holsters he produces, does he supply police officers in particular? Oh yeah, yes. He uh, he he makes actually really. He hasn't really wanted to go that big with it yet because he's still working with the uh, sheriff's department. So that takes a lot of time, and there's there's people that he has really high demand, and uh, if he was to open that full time, there'd be no way he'd ever keep up. That's why he's. But yes, he does do odd for people he knows that he works with and things like that and he yeah he makes he makes pretty good profit and he'll make you one if you have a catch yeah. good job I'm trying to think. I've got a, I've got a couple. 
Every CCW class. Yeah. Yeah. That's how we do. Oh, alien gear. Yeah, they're pretty slick. I, I kind of like it. They kind of came out nowhere. All right, I'm going to go do something. You can go make your second I could, yeah. I could. This might take you up on it. My judge is ready. Excellent. 
Every year, approximately 5.5 to 6.7 million bats die due to common diseases. Hello, my name is Michael Esbrook, and today we're going to be talking about the war on bats. The reason I chose bats is I find bats very interesting. Ever since I was younger, I would watch documentaries and TV shows that would relate to bats, such as Steve, Steve Irwin, um, Animal Planet, and the movie We Bought a Zoo, um, directed by Cameron Crowe. Um, some facts about bats is that bats are mammals. Um, one fact that I found out is that they give birth to live young, and their young typically take four to six months to mature to the point of being independent and being able to find their own food. Bats are insectivorous, which mean which means that they um, eat bats. Um, approximately seventy percent of bats are insectivorous, and the other thirty um, eat fruits, and some drink blood. Sorry about that. Um, bats are also a great form of insect control. They typically bats will eat forty percent to under hundred percent of their body weight. Um, for my research, I focused on two types of two common diseases in bats. I focused on white nose syndrome and rabies. White nose syndrome is an invasive skin infection, fungal skin infection, excuse me, that um, attacks the fat storage. White nose syndrome was first discovered in 2006 in New York in a local cave. It has a 75 to 100 percent mortality rate. And as of right now, the only cure is if, sorry, um, white nose syndrome is transmitted via clothing or trash that is left in caves whenever people come to visit. And every year, once again, approximately 5.5 to 6.7 million bats die just due to white nose syndrome. The second disease I covered was rabies. Rabies is an acute progressive and fatal encephalitis, which means it is an inflation in the brain, which causes um, many, sorry. Um, rabies is typically transmitted by direct bites, saliva that is in an open wound, or neural tissue that is exposed into an open wound. Its symptoms usually consist of dizziness, fatigue, um, a fever, loss of appetite, delirium, fear, or hallucinations. As of right now, if you get rabies, there is no set cure, but if you have symptoms, it's best to get shots. That way the infection can be slowed. Um, for my product, I made a bat house. Bat houses. My bat house was 26 and a half inches by 12 inches by one and three fourths inches. My bat house took me approximately eight hours to make, and I did it in my local garage that I have in my house. Bat houses are very important. Bat houses allow um, bats a safe place to rest, and it allows them to be safe from the diseases. Another great thing is that bats help pollinate plants, and you can make great fertilizer from their droppings. For my product, I used a power drill, a circular saw, a chalking gun, a paintbrush, clamps, and a level. Um, for the process of my bat house, I pre-drilled holes. I then made grooves into the wood. That way, the bats can latch on and climb in. I then chalked pieces of wood. That way it would seal it. Um, this is me using the clamps to make sure that they actually seal properly. And those last two are me painting the bat house. For my challenges, I had financial, financial management and mentor issues. For financial management, a, I, before I never really had a sense of fiscal responsibility. Um, I would always spend my money right when I got it and just not save it up. For this, I had to save up my money in order to buy the lumber from our local lumberyard, which was true value. And actually, I made a budget for that. Um, for my mentor issues, I had a lot of trouble um, contacting my mentor. So most of my product, for most of my product, I had to do it by myself. 
Thank you. Do my judges have any questions?
some way to have one light on? Or is it all or nothing? It's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. Okay. okay. Yes, it is. <laughs> All right, good. As society has progressed with civilization, we have grown more accustomed to electronic devices that we use every day, and books are no different. Good evening, my name is Naomi Lane, and I'll be talking to you about the benefits, inconveniences, and vast history of both printed and e-books. E Before printed books came to be, there were other ways of documentation, such as carving into stone, or even carving given characters of a given char characters of a given language into a piece of wood and then using ink to press them down on a piece of fabric. And this was most common in China, Korea, and ancient Japan. And in Europe, a way that was most common there was to have isolated monks write everything down by hand. And this could take up to days or even months to complete before binding the parchment up into a set of wooden or leather covers. Another way that was most common was scrolls of a pirates that would then be read out by a given or to a given population. And was in the 1450s, a man by the name of John Gutenberg invented the printing press. And then decades later, in the 1500s, more than 1,700 presses were made, and more than 27,000 books with more than 10 million copies were sent out to the general public. And before the, press, the printing press was invented, books were harder to come by considering they were very rare and only the wealthy had possessed them. And this caused lower income families to be less educated than what they should have been. The benefits of both printed and ebooks come with education and they can help uh, kids with specific language impairment learn up to 36 new words in a given period with the help of colorful illustrations and printed books helped out more with this because there was more you can manipulate than with just messing with the screen. It also helped more out with mental effects because a study done out of a thousand students, 213 of them said that it increased their levels of empathy towards others, decreased their stress, and overall increased their mental health. Some inconveniences of ebooks is that it can cause visual fatigue. And this basically causes headaches that make people just not look at screens for a while. And that causes for a shorter reading time. Storage space is another inconvenience considering each device has a certain amount of room. And once you've reached enough, fill up enough room on your ebook, that's all you can really have. So that's that. And then some limitations is copyright. Uh, certain carriers like the Kindle or Nook tablet only have certain books they can have due to copyright. And that just makes it limited on you and anyone else who's want to use it. I chose to do books because it's one of the things I love. It's one of my passions. I always carry books on me no matter where I go. And even now in my school bag that's currently in my locker, there's at least five books in there. I just love reading. And I chose to have a book sale because it helped show the value of printed books to anyone who came to it. And I actually chose my product before I chose my research. I knew I wanted to do something with books, and that's exactly what I did. But to come up with just a book sale, I had to do several different things because my first idea was already taken. And then after I chose the book sale, I then found out that I was going to do my research paper over how printed books are better than ebooks. So that's entirely what my research paper is about. My product was my book sale, which I held on January 20th of this year. It was 11 to 5, and I actually started earlier than what it should have, but that's because we got everything ready. I Every book was either a dollar up to five, and it really just was on condition and size, besides every children's books, which was only a dollar. I sold around 40 books and made $81 in the span of the six hours I had my sale. And there's the book sale that my flyer, I see right there, it did say 12 and I did have it at 11, but. And there's some pictures of my sale. These books right here were all sold and some over here was also. Now the only problems I had was procrastination. I know that if I didn't wait until the last minute like I did with most stuff, I would have had more done and probably a better outcome than what I did. Cause I only had around 10, 15 people actually show up in the six hours I had my sale. 
So that was probably one, one of the things that in the future I will try to fix if I ever have another event such like this. In conclusion, as society has progressed, we have grown more accustomed to technological advances, and I believe that it is important that we keep older things alive, such as printed books, on our schools, our libraries, and our homes. Thank you. Do my judges have any questions? What type of genre books do you like? I like more like fantasy and kind of romance. Where did you have your book sale? I had my book sale at J here in Moat JLo's or at the Level Point Fire Department. Do you prefer ebooks or? I prefer printed books. <laughs> <laughs> And I was going to ask you where you got your books. All of them were donated. I thought I, I forgot to mention that in my presentation, but yeah, all of them were donated from people around town. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 
I had you scheduled a lot of that I said you can me I would think that would be a little easier. I didn't make it on the office in there last year. Yeah. Oh, was last year the year we had like eight seniors? Yeah. 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 I sent your mom a picture as Z. She said she would watch her. Yeah, I don't know about that. I think she said she got it figured out. Oh, yes, yeah. She said you dad's having surgery and all. Yes, because they forgot to hold his feet in are you are you aren't coming back? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think they're just because they haven't even started yet. Okay. I've been in here for at least there's no three <laughs> we would as well. It yeah. goes along with the thing. I like the pink trailer. I thought it was a cool idea. <laughs> I don't think you can. I don't think you have very many. You know, later. If I had an inch, I got a one. It's down the bottom of that. Oh, well, it's down the bottom. Oh, because I didn't have mine on for the first two or three. You just said, Where's your name? She's not doing it. Too. She didn't feel like it this year. I don't know why. I got too busy. I get too busy. Yeah. I enjoy it. I love it. I do too. I get so many. We plan. Well, how old is your Well, Chelsea's been out school 10 years, right? I don't know. She's been out 15 years. Oh, okay. And I don't know. She's been out 15 years. Oh, okay. And I don't know. Judges ready? Yep. In the summer of 1996, after 35 radiation treatments, three rounds of chemo, and three times of being diagnosed with breast cancer, being in remission two times, Kathy Newby lost her life due to breast cancer. You may ask, why does this mean so much to me? 
who is Kathy Newby. Kathy Newby is my grandmother, and this project means so much to me because I never got to meet my grandma. And I would like to give other people or children, a little boy, their opportunity to meet their grandmother someday. Good afternoon, my name is Waylon Woolsey, and I'm here to tell you about my project, Pulling for a Cure. I've done my research on the standardized ways of treatment, such as chemo and radiation, and also the natural ways of treatment, such as prayer treatment. Um, just a few statistics. statistics. Women from the age of 45 to 54 have the highest chance of receiving breast cancer at 28%. Women from the age of 20 to 34 have a 1% chance of getting invasive breast cancer. And women that are 85 years or older only have a 2% chance of getting invasive breast cancer. 61 is the median age for breast cancer. 1.3 million women die in the year or die in the U.S. per year. One, that, one out of 4,566 of these women will die from invasive breast cancer. A little bit of history on breast cancer. It has been around as long as the human race has been around and has actually been dated back to 1600 BC in Egypt. There are a few different causes for breast cancer. One is physical injury, as bumping the breast, falling on the breast, or even some case in some cases of the when breastfeeding, the children biting it. And then blockages of the lymph glands, which is caused by curdled milk in the left in the milk ducts while breastfeeding. There are a few different historic treatments of breast cancer. One is prayer in 1600 BC in Egypt. They would pray up to 13 different to 13 different gods to try to heal breast cancer. They also used opium and arsenic. They would rub opium on the breast and then try actually burning the breast off with fire. In the mid 18th century is when surgery and chemo and radiation first became popular and not only in the US but all over the world. There are 101 medical schools that incorporate prayer, your prayer, prayer and religion into your treatment plan. Like at OMC they, in West Plains, they ask very specifically, what, are, what is your belief in God? Do you believe in God? Do you want us to incorporate prayer on your treatment plan? And they do a very good job of actually doing that, incorporating it. And chemotherapy is used to kill the cancer cells with very strong medicines. Chemotherapy is usually followed up by a surgery, but chemotherapy is, is used to shrink the larger tumors. It doesn't actually completely eliminate the tumor if it's over a certain size. It will if it's small enough. Surgery is not always required after chemotherapy, but in some cases it can just be used by itself if the tumor is small enough. Chemotherapy also cost around $10,000 per treatment. My grandma, Kathy, had breast cancer three times. The, the first time they removed the tumor and no treatment. The second and third time she underwent chemotherapy, she had her breast completely removed. Radiation therapy is the use of ultraviolet rays or x-rays to actually burn the, the tumor out of the breast. The, just like chemotherapy, radiation is usually followed up by a surgical procedure. That way they are for sure that they got it all. Um, radiation therapy is very quick and only takes a minute or two, but needs to be done five days a week for six to seven weeks in very small doses because the ultraviolet rays from the radiation is very, very harmful to the body. Just like chemotherapy, radiation therapy also has its side effects is such as tiredness, skin irritation, um, dry skin, fatigue, although the skin usually heals after radiation is completed, but not in all cases. It, radiation therapy costs around $10,000, which is pretty close to, to the same amount as chemotherapy. And my grandma Kathy underwent 35 radiation treatments during her second encounter with breast cancer. This radiation therapy caused permanent damage to her breath to the skin from the burns. Why I decided to do my project was being the natural born salesman that I am, I decided to manufacture a trailer and sell raffle tickets for. I met with Miss Carol Silvey from West Plains, at the OMC Foundation of West Plains, and found out that there was a fund that actually helps breast cancer patients here in Howard County if they need gas money to go to treatment or if they need money to help with food. or It's not actually for the cure 
of breast cancer, but it's to help the women that need financial help to actually get the treatment done. This is how the plan that I had developed that I would raise money for breast cancer. Given the odds that one in eight women will get invasive, invasive breast cancer in their lifetime, this money could go to help someone that I know or that you may know. In fact, since I began this project, my aunt Brenda was diagnosed with stage one breast cancer. I decided to use the skills that I already had with, to build the trailer to make that, I, that me and my grandma both could be proud of. This is my product before. There was much thought that went into building this trailer before I started, as I had built three trailers before, but every one of those had their problems. And I wanted this trailer to be perfect since it was gonna be seen by a lot of the public. It wasn't just for somebody that I knew. It was for the whole community to see and be proud of. Um, one of our trailers would actually bend when you push on one corner of it. One, the tailgate didn't latch right. And one, it didn't really pull straight down the road, so I wanted to make sure that they were per this one was perfect. Um, starting out was kind of stressful because I had a pile of metal laying on the floor, and I gave myself a very strict deadline to get it done. I gave myself two to three weeks to get it done so I could have it in the homecoming parade for uh, or here in town. That way I could show it to the community and start selling tickets on it and start raising money as soon as possible. I, the first day I remember I walked in the shop and seen that big pile of metal laying on the floor and I thought, I'm not going to get this done in time. <laughs> this is my product Deering. We built most of the trailer upside down as the cross braces and the tongue and all of that. This is my product after and this is where the real work started. I started selling raffle tickets and I, was, I went to Summersville, Mountain View, Willow, Houston, Mountain Grove, and West Plains. And every weekend I was taking the trailer somewhere selling raffle tickets for it. I prepared a speech to give in front of the whole gym in, uh, at the Hoop Queen game, basketball games, where I decided to give it away. And I was not expecting that many people to be there. The gym was packed. And I also created a Facebook page, which you can see right down there on my trifold. And this is kind of how I would reach to my, I don't, not all of my family members live here. My grandma Kathy was from Oregon and we would actually, we were friends with them on Facebook. We added them to the page and that's how we reached all across the United States and even into Canada. I sold six tickets in Canada and around 13 or 14 tickets in Texas and 16 tickets in Oregon. My challenges were, my main one was the trailer actually broke. We was, had it down at the homecoming parade. We was in a hurry building it. And I had forgot to weld on the underneath side, the smallest little bead. And about 10 kids went and jumped on the front of it to get on the trailer. We was all gung-ho, ready to get in the parade. And the hitch came detached from the tongue, bent it down. And we actually had to, I spent all day or all night that night pretty well trying to fix it because we were supposed to have it at a football game the next day. <laughs> and then public speaking, I'm not a very good public speaker, never claimed to be, but <laughs> I, have gave, I have gave it my all and I feel like I've overcome both of these challenges. And in conclusion, this is the hardest fight of their lives and survivorship it is a very sweet victory. Over the years, there's been many types of treatment for breast cancer, from actually trying to burn the breast off with fire, and now to trying to burn the tumor away with radiation. The not, there are many natural ways as well, such as prayer treatments, which I think are very, very helpful in fighting for breast cancer, because if your mind's not right, the survivorship is not a very sweet victory. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, how did you raise the money to build the trailer? I actually had, uh, I went around to where we had got the materials before and like Westgate Trailers donated a lot and lot of materials such as the hitch, the lug nuts, the axle, or not the axle, but the, a lot of the accessories that went on it, not the actual metal to the trailer. Pipes Plus did donate some of the metal to the trailer. And, we got a bunch of donations, and then I paid for $496 of it out of my own pocket, which 
is just oh. part of it. <laughs> well, first, how's your aunt Kathy since she was diagnosed with breast cancer? I don't, she is not doing so. Not Kathy, things. I'm sorry, Brenda. Um, so, you never met your grandmother? No, ma'am. So, how did this idea, was it uh, your, your, your parent or? Yes, I've always been told that I act just like my grandma Kathy, look just like her. And in a way, that kind of hurts me because I never really get to meet her. Okay. Yes. You said you sold tickets in Canada. Yes. Did you ever uh, think how you were going to get the trailer up there if <laughs> someone won? Yes, I thought about that, and I told them that I would meet them halfway, and that's. I'm glad they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. How old you money? Did your senior project give to that charity? Three thousand and twenty dollars. Wow. Are there any other questions? Yes, what are you plan? Are your plans for next year? I plan on to start work at Kirkman Farms in Summersville, and then in June, intend to auctioneer school in St. Louis. Any future fun ride and fun plans for? I would really like to do another trailer. This was a lot of fun getting to go out in the community and sell tickets and see everybody and hear stories like yours that have actually met my grandmother. And I, I really had a ball with this project. Thank you. And so now when I sign papers and like receipts and stuff, and they hand it to me straight, and so they're turning this way, and they're like, well, have you seen that before? And I'm like, well, years ago, I had to adjust to the, the desk. They were not for my hand. It really is. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, I don't know. I didn't do anything. I literally just moved the mouse. And it... That was him just a second ago. Yeah. Holy crap. Let's go get, go get Andrew. Did you break it? I just moved the mouse and it just went off of the live stream. <laughs> I don't know no. Oh, all right, I need to be there. In other words, if you might not be able to see your PowerPoint very well. <laughs> 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 Okay, so you're good. You just opened it. Yeah, you're still good. Thank you. 
Oh. Are my judges ready? Yes. Yes. Imagine with me for a minute a world where physical activity is non existent, where children and adults the same sit at home with nothing productive to do, so they play on their tablets and watch Netflix. This is a very sad future, but it is coming. And physical activity is something that definitely needs to be more iterated in the in the school system. If something stands between you and your success, move it. Never be denied. Dwayne The Rock Johnson. I've always been a physically active kind of guy. I've been involved in a lot of sports throughout my high school and middle school career. I've done basketball, track, cross country, golf, if you consider that a sport. I have also been involved in a lot of weightlifting classes and physical education throughout my school career as well. And I feel that it's a necessity for children to learn this this need for a physical activity at a young age. So that it's instilled in their minds that they need to be active on a daily basis just to stay in shape. For my research, I looked into the many negatives and positives of physical activity and how you can prevent some of the negatives. The first thing that leads us to is obesity. Obesity is described as an above average amount of body fat, and for different people, that's a different number. And there's many different causes for obesity as well. First, it could be your exercising habits or your eating habits. And I believe these two tend to go hand in hand because if you're not doing one right, you're probably not doing the other right either. It can also just be caused by your genetics. You could just be born obese, and that is just another way that obesity could occur, occur to you. Next, we have the main mental benefits from physical activity. First, if you're physically active during your younger years of life, it's going to make you more likely to have a less high chance of getting dementia in your later years of life. You're also going to be, you're going to have better brain aging. The more active you are, it's going to keep blood flowing to your brain and help it just to keep working right all throughout your life. And finally, you come to, it's going to increase your cognitive brain function. Now, some of you might be sitting out there wondering, what is cognitive brain function? Well, I'm here to tell you. Cognitive brain function is when you have a good amount of oxygenated blood flowing to the brain at a certain amount of time. And this, this is usually whenever you're being active, more blood is going to be flowing to your brain, helping it to work better. <clears throat> Next, we have the injuries, though. And like everything, there's always downsides. For physical activity, it's injuries. The first injury we have is shin splints. This is a very low-level injury. It can occur to almost anyone. You could. It usually occurs in walkers, people who just like to walk for physical activity just to stay fit. And what shin splints is described as is an inflammation in the tissue in the front of the leg, in the shin area. Next, we have the sprained ankle. This is more of an injury that comes to a higher active person, I would like to say. They're going to be doing a lot more running, jumping, side-to-side -side movement, movement, and they might be more likely to turn an ankle. But these injuries, although they are painful, they're very curable and easily curable as well. And this is with the right system. You might be wondering what that is as well. Well, it's actually an acronym. The R stands for rest. You need to rest the injury. You need to stay off of it. Try to keep the swelling down. The I stands for ice. You need to ice the affected area. This is going to help to, help to stop the swelling, slow it. You need to, the C stands for compression. You need to keep compression on the affected area, and this is going to help push the swelling back up the leg. And you also need to keep it elevated. By keeping the affected area elevated, it's just going to help to keep the heart from not pumping too much blood to the affected area, causing it to swell more. Now, through doing all of this research, it just helped lead me to what I thought I should do for my product. My product, I decided to do the National Walk to School Day. You can see here, here's all the children that were, some of the children that were involved. They weren't all at school the day the picture was taken. Now, I went through quite a bit of planning for this National Walk to School Day. Just so you know, it occurs on October 4th every year. First, 
the first step that went into planning this event, I had to gather supplies. I had to get tables, chairs for the people who would be working at the event, signing children in. And for this, I just decided to ask around the Willow Springs High School to see if I could maybe obtain a few chairs and tables that way, try to save myself money. I next had to call around. I first thought about calling G&W, but then I realized that this would be a fairly short walk, and if I want to get children physically active in the morning, I'm going to need to have a little bit longer of a walk. So my mentor and I, Jim Taylor, we decided to call Town & Country instead, which is approximately a mile from the high school. So we decided to call them, and I spoke with their manager, and he gave us the okay. I called quite a few times just to make sure it was still good and I could have the event there. And they said it was all good. Next, I had to make and hang flyers. Now this, it was a slight problem for me because I'm not the most technically advanced, I guess you could say. I didn't know how to use the program on the computer called the Cricut to cut out letters. So I had to learn that first before so I could make the letters to put on my banners, put on my signing tables. I then had to type flyers, and this was also a bit of a task because after I had my first flyers made and hung, I got a phone call from the elementary office and they said, well, you got your dates wrong. So I had to go run around and pick all them up before anyone got the wrong idea on when it was happening. And I retyped them, went around, hung up some more banners and flyers, and it was set to go. And I also had to talk with the, uh, I believe it's the assistant principal in the elementary, Mr. Cottingham, and asked him if it would be okay for me to do a presentation at Rise and Shine to present the children with certificates thanking them for coming to the walk. Now, though it seems like this project really went smoothly for me and I didn't have any problems, I had a few. First, I had to plan around the weather. And if any of you have lived in Missouri for more than a week, you know that this weather is wild. One day it can be 100, the next it might be snowing, you never know. And my my product, product was no exception. The whole week I was watching the weather, making sure it was going to be a go for on the 4th. All up until the day before, 100% clear. Then the day before the event, 100% chance of rain. And so I had to go over to the office, make a, make a school reach call, just to inform the parents not to show up because nobody's going to be there. I also had to work on managing my time. I might not come off as a procrastinator, but I definitely am. I don't like to do things unless I absolutely have to, and this I absolutely had to, so I just really had to buckle down and get after it, get things done. The biggest challenge for me, though, I believe, was planning the event. I never planned an event, although it wasn't a very large event. I think there was 40 children who showed up and, like, 10 adults who walked. It, it was a large event to me. I had never planned one of this size. But in all, I feel that the walk was a big success, even with all the hiccups that came with it, such as the weather, the planning, all of it. And in all, I just feel that if physical activity is such an easily obtainable thing with so many positive benefits, what would what keeps you from not wanting to do it? Thank you. Do I have any questions? So did you do it on a different day? Is that yeah, I actually get the word out? I reschedule it to October the 6th, which was a Friday, and I there's a system called School Reach where you record a message and then it sends out later that night to all the parents and informs them of the information. We talked about uh, talked about injuries and what to do to treat them. Uh, did you come across any re uh, any research? Did you come across anything? about preventing those types of injuries. Um, I actually did. You can, you could, it said you can speak to a healthcare provider and get a stretching plan that's set for you to get you ready before you engage in your activity. Yes. What are your plans for next year? Well, you might think I'm going to go into the physical education field, but I'm actually going into construction. That cricket might come in handy there. <laughs> <laughs> I think it might. <laughs> Putting in construction. I'm hoping to be building houses. Oh, well, I'm just going to have a house built, so. <laughs> <laughs> Get your mind. Yeah. <laughs>
Any other questions? When a child exercises, what is it that their brain does? Um, it just helps their brain to be more engaged. There's also actual research that I read that says when a child is engaged throughout their day in physical activity, it actually helps to keep their brain more engaged in the classroom as well. Yes. And what were the ages of the children that took part? They went from kindergarten all the way up to sixth grade. Is that all? Thank you. I live down South 17. Okay. Like, I don't like, 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 I drive to those planes every day and it does not take me 45 minutes. Yeah, I live like close to South to Lanton and then <laughs> I turn on their own, go down another dirt road, and then, like I, I gotcha. hold them all the way back. Just, just just so, yeah. 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 He has his. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, actually, I am in here for the next one. I'm just kidding. And I actually apparently wasn't supposed to judge the one before. But I did. So, whoops. I apparently, I have. Actually, see, twenty minutes. Right? You realize all around. Okay. 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 Okay.
Yeah. 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 Yeah.
To many, firefighters live and breathe firefighting. That is what they are paid to do, so they do it. The reality is most firefighters are strictly volunteer and take time out of their lives helping others in need. Hello, I'm Zeke Webb, and I will be talking to you today about the realities of firefighting. I chose this topic for my senior project due to my involvement with the Willow Springs City Fire Department and the Tyrone Volunteer Fire Department. I volunteer in both of these departments and respond to calls when the need, when the need arises. When it comes to firefighting, the majority of the population may be limited in what they know about the subject. Many may only know what they have learned in grade school presentations, such as the Elementary Fire Prevention Week. Others may have their views based on what they have seen on various firefighting dramas shown on TV today. While what people have seen in these presentations and shows may be correct, firefighting itself holds in depth more possible scenarios and dangers than the everyday person may realize. There are many dangers involved in firefighting. Many consist of the obvious, such as burns, falls, or being struck by objects while working. While these are commonly thought of first when considering the dangers, they only accounted for 20% of on-duty firefighter deaths in 2016. One of the leading medical factors affecting firefighters today is cancer. Studies have shown that those involved in firefighting face a 9% increase in their chances of being diagnosed. Studies have also shown that those involved have shown a 14% increase in cancer-related deaths. The increase in cancer is due to heightened levels of toxic exposures that firefighters face on a daily basis. There are many harmful chemicals involved in fighting fires. Some of these chemicals, such as polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, are present in all smoke. The largest amount of harmful chemicals come from man-made products in the home. Common items such as vinyl flooring or clothes can hold harmful chemicals such as benzene and formaldehyde. These chemicals are carcinogens, which have been shown to lead to cancer. As of 2015, it was reported that there was approximately 1,160,450 firefighters in the United States. Of these, 70% were registered as volunteer. While this may seem like a substantial amount, it is becoming increasingly apparent to those involved that there is a decreasing amount of interest shown in younger generations. This may be due to the fact that volunteers are often subject to unpredictable schedules. This can lead to varying amounts of participation by those who are even very active in their departments. Another factor is the monetary effect of volunteer work. In today's world, it's becoming increasingly difficult to volunteer time that can be spent on work or earning income that is crucial for some. For many in younger generations, it's simply not cost effective to volunteer their time. This is a troubling fact for those trying to find new ways to introduce recruits to their departments. For many departments, the only way they're able to stay in operation is cooperation with other departments. If the department has needs a tool that another department has, they can simply call on each other to complete the task at hand. Working together also allows the departments to cut costs. Departments can trade uh, equipment or gear for the firefighters to wear if they have something the other dep department needs. Working together also allows the departments to complete jobs quicker and more efficiently. They are also able to work together more efficiently due to increase familiarity with each other from working together. According to the International Association of Fire Chiefs, fire, volunteer firefighters are believed to be saving an average of $37 billion of the American taxpayer's money on a yearly basis. Even with such large amounts of funds being saved by volunteers, many departments across the country are struggling to stay open due to financial reasons. All across the country, departments are operating with insufficient funding. Because my research covered firefighting, I decided that I needed to find a way to connect this to a product that could help the general population and probably find a way to help those in need. While running through ideas with teachers in the school, the idea to host the Elementary Fire Prevention Week came up. So therefore, I decided to host a fire safety presentation with the Willow Springs City Fire Department to the Willow Springs Elementary students. While, running, while working with my mentor, Aaron Brower, and the Willow Springs City Fire Chief, Matt Foster, I was able to come up with a presentation that was suitable for elementary age children. Chief Foster informed me that the Willow Springs City allots a yearly budget of $1,200 specifically for the purpose of teaching the community about fire safety. With this money, we were able to purchase hats, pencils, and stickers for the children to take home afterwards. The elementary also provided the time schedule that I needed to align my lesson plan with to be able to incorporate all the grades into the presentation. We would start out every presentation by showing the kids the gear the firefighters wear. This ranges from the special boots we wear to the air packs we use to help keep breathing in toxic chemicals while we work. We would use this opportunity to help the children familiarize with this look 
all with the hopes that if an emergency does occur, they would not be afraid to seek help from us. After that, we would teach the, the kids about the importance of fire safety and what to do if they ever found themselves in a fire, as you can see in this video here. And the kids really seem to enjoy it too. You know? And we would end every presentation by showing the kids the fire trucks and the tools we have on it. Their favorite part by far had to be when we let them spray water out of the fire hose. Uh, the main struggle I faced with my project was in my public speaking ability. I had to create and perform a lesson plan to over 500 elementary students. This is something I have had no previous experience with at all. And because of this, I'm now more confident in my public speaking abilities and my confidence as a leader. And we'll go back to Joel Lovelace and his story. Uh, after a long 10 hours working the orphanage fire, Joel was finally able to go home. He arrived just before sunlight and was only able to take a shower before seeing his children off to school. After working straight through the night with no sleep, he prepares for another long day of work. Although it may be tough for Joel to live like this at times, he knows that everything he does is important to the fire department and the lives of those he helps. I hope after hearing this presentation, you might decide to try to make a change in your community by volunteering on your local fire department. Thank you. You might just have any questions. Mm -hmm. How much does all your gear weigh when you have it all on? Uh, just the helmet, jacket, pants, and boots is 45 pounds. Once we have the air pack, the mask, and whatever tool we may carry, it averages about 90 pounds. Are there any other questions? How about when you play it? <laughs> <laughs> that can vary a lot. So do you plan to continue on volunteering? I do plan to continue volunteering. Uh, it's not going to be my main job. I'm planning on going to school for mechanical engineering, but I do definitely plan to do this. Where do you plan to go to school at? Uh, Louisiana Tech. I have a work cited page, but it's not clicking. Okay. In this case, I was wondering. Do you have to do any kind of um, physical training to stay in shape to do that? That's definitely an aspect that's important because that <laughs> is very tiring working along fire. Like I said in my example, you can be there 10 plus hours, it just depends on the fire. You need to be physically capable to be able to carry the weight of the gear and whatever equipment you may be taken along with it. So being physically able is a very important job. How long did it take you to prepare to speak to the elementary students? That That's hard to explain really because really I, I had to prepare right up until the moment till because I've never done that before so I kept running through my head what I was going to say but I started preparing about a month ahead of time you know talking to Miss Brower and Chief Matt Foster and they kind of gave me examples of what they had done in the past and what would work good with the children. I think it worked out pretty well. Which was tougher, presenting to them or presenting to us? Oh, probably to them. There was a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, over 500. Any more questions? Is it hard to balance that with in school? Not really, because because this is just volunteer, so I don't have to show up to everything that there is. And they fully understand that school comes first. How many High school students are on the volunteer program. Right now, on our department, it'd be three: me, Joel Lovelace, and AJ Reese. And you're all seniors. Yes. So that's the big thing: is getting the younger kids involved. Because once we go to college, they are really wanting younger guys to carry around all the heavy stuff. <laughs> Any more questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. So, I'm going to go your finish.